Good morning, almost afternoon to everyone. We're so thankful that you've joined us on this Friday. Uh, we know this is a busy time for our public educators with star testing, et cetera, going on. Um, my name is Natalie Fikach, and I serve as one of the school mental health leads um, at the Texas Institute for Excellence in Mental Health as a part of the Texas System of Care and the MHCTC. And we would like to welcome you before I turn it over to Tammy and just let you know that this event is being hosted um, by the Texas System of Care, uh, which is a SAMHSA opportunity that we've had to build um, comprehensive school mental health systems and create community wraparound around some of our students in the state of Texas. And we're so glad that you're here and I'll pass it over to Tammy. Good morning, everybody. My name is Tammy Holland. I work for the Institute for Excellence in Mental Health along with Natalie. We are so glad that you could join us this morning for this opportunity. We're quite excited about it. Um, before we introduce the speakers, I do want to just mention how we're going to handle the CEU and um, training evaluation. So after the training concludes this afternoon, um, if you have completed the training, then we will be sending you an email inviting you to evaluate your experience and letting us know what you liked best, what you would like to see in the future, and that sort of thing. Uh, the evaluation will be very fast, very brief. And once you submit your evaluation, then we will send you a CEU certificate for your time um, today in the, in the training. Well, today we have two wonderful speakers. I want to introduce you, um, and, and I'll highlight them in just a moment. But we've got first Nicola Gardier. She has 18 years experience in education, and she currently serves as a secondary principal for three campuses at the Marlin Independent School District. She uh, currently serves as a senior fellow in the Texas Education Policy Institute where she works closely, oops, my notes just disappeared, <laughs> where she works closely with legislators and advocates for, um, for, for educators. She's a trainer of trainers for restorative discipline practices. Ms. Gardier proudly serves on the Jamaica Diaspora Education Task Force and is a founding member of Central Texas Alliance of Black School Educators. And then we also have Dr. Kiona White with us today. Dr. White has 20 years as an educator and she has held positions such as an early childhood educator, a secondary teacher, instructional coach, assistant principal and principal, college lecturer, and principal liaison with the Region 12 Service Center, and also executive director of professional development and curriculum. So in addition, Dr. White is the founder of a leadership consulting company called Ready Collect Lead, LLC. Um, again, we are very excited that you are with us today. I'm going to highlight our two speakers today and turn the floor over to them. Good morning, good morning. Thank you for having us here this morning to serve in this capacity. Um, as mentioned before, I'm Nicola Gardier. I am also a published author of two books and I have a best-selling release coming out of the end of this month on um, excellence in autism. Um, my first book was um, Live Your Abundant Life where I talk about the struggles I went through after my divorce. And my second book, which is crafted around the training we're doing right now is um, Circle Up, Restorative Discipline Practices for Today's Educators. And as mentioned before, my most um, the current one I have coming out at the end of this month talks about excellence in autism, which have also hosted multiple restorative circles with autistic children. As a parent to an autistic and a traumatic brain injured child, I know the struggles when it comes to communication. Um, I just really want to thank you guys for allowing us to be here again in this capacity. Dr. White and I have found a phenomenal partnership in each other where we serve. Our job is to serve the community. Dr. White. Thank you so much. So pardon me as I share my screen. Um, so like Nicola said, we actually got to know each other by working in the community. Um, we've done a lot of work inside the school buildings, but we realized how much of a need it is for us to partner with parents and with other community stakeholders to do what's best for kids. So thank you again. 
So we want to establish some norms. We have a lot of people in the room and I thank you so much for spending your time with us. We want to make sure that um, we will talk about some heavy topics. So we want to make sure that we assume positive intent and we want to stay present as much as we can. We will have a break built in and we'll have opportunities for you to speak. Um, we want to make sure that you add value because we know that you bring value. And we just want you to be very, very reflective of your practice. We know that when we're working with adults that they have a vast um, variety of experiences and we want you to bring that to the table um, because we are we're we're better together. So I want you to take a moment to just read our approach. We want you to know um, our thinking and kind of what anchors us. So if you can just take a moment to to read our approach. Okay, can I have someone come off mute? Is it anything that speaks to you? We can just do a random person to come off mute. Is it any piece of our beliefs that speak to you? Oh, I was going to say, I love the line that says, all of us are better than any of us because we can produce so many more things, so many, uh, so much richer material with all of us thinking about it. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And that's the approach we take. Yeah, and the whole child system of care also is really pertinent to to approaching all of what is what they're bringing to us in person as a whole person. And I really love that all people have value because I think sometimes in in the world, you know, people from all walks of life, you know, people look at them differently. But no matter what walk of life you're in. We all have values, so I really appreciated that. Thank you so much. I love that it says that the kid, all the kids are well when all the people around them are well. Yeah, absolutely. Linda, I see a hand raised. Would you like to um, share with us? Oh, that was me just now. I okay, thank you, Linda. Right. Okay, sorry, I didn't want to miss anyone. Thank you so much. Here's our table of contents. Um, one thing we are first, we're teachers. So with that, we have intentions, but we also want to make sure that we're flexible to what's happening in the space. And um, if you're okay with that, if you can give us a thumbs up that you, we will get to our expectations for the training, but we also want to be flexible and responsive to your needs. So if that's okay with you, if you can give us a thumbs up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So we want to start out first. I would like to know what is your superpower? So let me give you about 30 seconds to think of your superpower. And you may say, I mean, what is a superpower? How, how do I know I have a superpower? Well, we know that we can do hard things. And so when we face something difficult and um, we, we, we take some time to reframe and get our mind together, what do we bring to the table to solve that thing that we struggle with? Um, what do you do? Or what do you have that that is you think maybe a little bit better than some or better than most that you're really, really good at? I think it's important to name that. So if you can think for a second of what your superpower is. OK, if you can start putting that in the chat. Staying calm under pressure, memory. I like that. Ruby, Ooh. Karen, those are good. Positivity and a listen air. Stephanie, humor. Good intuition. All right, Evelyn. Determination. Okay. These are good. I love it. They're coming in. Thank you. Not what I do, but who I know. That's a superpower. I like that one. Absolutely. It's a superpower. Yes. So one awesome. of my superpowers, I would say, is making the complicated simple. Mm -hmm. Making the complicated simple, I would say, is my superpower. What is your superpower, Nicola? My superpower is being able to remain calm under pressure or with the uncertainty, just being calm, finding that stillness and staying there, but staying focused. Absolutely. So there'll be some times when we're going to ask you to lean into that superpower, sometimes for yourself and sometimes for others. So we're going to move on. OK, next, I want us to, to start with um, this video and I want you um, to listen to Oprah and I want you to watch um, and, and notice um, 
what she says about intentions. What is the real reason? What is the real motivation? What is the energy of my intention that's going to go into my thoughts and action and then be returned back to me? It is law. It's law. Intention, your intention is always one with the law. Meaning, before you even think about a thing, you have an intention for the thing. And that the intention is going to determine the outcome. You get to be the master of your own fate. You get to be the captain of your own soul. And if you just manage that, if you just took care of your territory, oh, the glorious, 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 wondrous, wondrous opportunities and possibilities that are waiting for you. So the question is, what are you resisting? What are you pushing against? What are you not allowing? What are you blocking? Because you have this idea of who and what you're supposed to be instead of leaning into the dream that's already been created and waiting for you. It's waiting for you. And the second, I mean, it doesn't, it's an instant thing. It's a shift in the way you see yourself and the power from which you have come. Oh my goodness, that is so, so powerful. I want to give you a moment to reflect on the video. Oprah had a very powerful question that she asked. She said, what are you resisting? Is there anything that you're resisting? So I want you to think about that. As we do this work, um, a lot of the work sometimes is with ourselves. Sometimes is um, we may be resisting something with maybe the families that we serve or something in the community. Um, as you can tell, I like to grapple with the hard things right on, like firsthand. So if you can just think about that, would anyone be willing to share anything that they may be resisting in this work? Or any other shares that you would like to talk about as far as intentions? I'm going to come back to that that thought. I'll give you a little time and you may want to spiral back at another time. The reason why I played that video, I think it's important for us all to start with intentions. Because whenever we get ready to build positive relationships with people, our intentions matter and they show up. And sometimes our intentions, we have intentions for other people. And so number one, we have to, our first strategy is you have to know yourself and you have to be true to that. So if you can, you can see there are a variety of pictures that are here on the screen. And they mean um, a lot to me. They show different pieces and experiences um, from my life. And we are all a mosaic of all our experiences. But if you see um, at the bottom picture, that is, I was in Head Start. So I'm thankful to Head Start for giving me a good start. But I was in Head Start. And if you see those apartments um, right next to it, those apartments were low-income housing um, in Mort Morton, Mississippi. Um, my family had just moved from Fort Wayne, Indiana. My parents were going through a divorce. And so that's, that was one of the places that my mom could afford. So we moved into these apartments. They were brand new at the time. We did not know that they were low-income housing. One thing that my mom shared with um, us is, this is where we live, but this is not who we are. And that was very powerful to me. And so, but shortly after she was able to marry um, someone who lived out in the country and we got a house and he had land. So, and she got a new job and it changed the trajectory of all of our lives. And that job took us off the free uh, lunch list. So I know what it's like to receive food stamps. I know what it's like to live in low income housing. Um, this is my husband. We have a son. I did not put him on here today, but um, so I also know what it's like to be a, sing uh, a teenage mom. So I've had some, some real intense experiences at an early age. And what I'm thankful for is I'm thankful that I learned shame early. And I know that may sound, that may sound interesting, but I, I learned shame early. And once I overcame that, I knew that I could do hard things after that. And I thought, there's nothing else. There's nothing else that I'll do that's harder than this. And if I've done this, I know I have a superpower that I could use and I can leverage. So, um, at the top, I always anchor my work in um, my former students. And so um, that's me with the hat on. And that's one of my friends who also taught with me when I first started teaching. And this beautiful young lady here, her name is Brittany. I met Brittany when she was in middle school. Brittany had lost her father. And so she was very, very um, 
depressed, honestly. She did not know her beauty. She did not know her worth. And um, I remember um, when she was in seventh grade, um, she was having a, she was very creative, but she was having a hard time writing for her star test. And we told her to just, you know, tell your story, tell your story about your father. What was that like to attend his funeral? And so that's what she wrote her piece on. And she got the highest marks on that. We stayed in contact throughout the years, but she is, I always think about the Britneys because Britney is living an amazing life. And I was able to go to her wedding um, last month. So these students, they are near and dear to me. Um, the other two, they are they were very high performers the whole time. So um, I want you to know that we also, I always try to make sure that we, we, we are intentional about serving those students too. But I'm so proud of all the things that they're doing. So we have Kosi Anelli, um, who is doing amazing things at Howard University. And then here we have Lexi Tankersley, and she worked for Nickelodeon. And so just, just to know that these students were in my class and that they're doing great things. And that's what I want for all children, regardless of where they start. I want them to end up living their best lives. So I had to learn strategy number two. I had to learn how to leverage my story because when I started teaching, I realized that students saw themselves very, very differently than me. They did not think that I had gone through anything. I would talk to them about things and they would say, you just don't understand. Um, you, you didn't have it hard like I've had it. And so I realized then that that I needed to be more vulnerable with my students and I need to show them that I'm not just telling you to do something. I'm telling you because I have done it. Um, I have high expectations for you because people had high expectations for me. And so you have to learn how to leverage your story and be, um, it's not about being a student's friend, but it's about being human with them and leveraging your story to let them know that I too know what it's like um, to feel shame. I too know what it's like to, to go without. And I, I also know what it's like to be proud of yourself and to um, to network and to meet people and to, to come out of that. And so I can show you how to do that. So um, leveraging your story is, a, is an amazing strategy. So I want to take a moment and I want you to think about this question. How does your story show up in your work? So I want to give you a second to think about that. How does your story show up in your work? I want to start out first by allowing people to just volunteer to speak. Um, or I can do a cold call. I can volunteer. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I think for me personally in the field that I'm working in, um, of course my background did influence a lot of what I'm doing at the moment. So coming from someone in my family suffering from paranoid schizophrenia did motivate me to understand more about the field and then educating my family and then implementing that into the community. And and it kind of humbles you when you come across other people and you understand their story. So a little bit about that. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's amazing. Would anyone else like to share? I can tell you that I always start out all of my trainings with sharing a little bit about myself. And um, recently, one of the ladies that I worked with, I found out some very, very things, uh, hard things that she's done in her life. And she said, um, I just want to let you know that I've never shared my story at work. That's been something that I always kind of I, I hit it. And she said, but um, you sharing your story gave me permission to share mine. So I want you to know that when you, you share your story and you're vulnerable with other people, they also connect with that. And that's what that's what helps us to be better together is the vulnerability and the connectedness that we are more alike than we are different. So let's move on to. Um, sorry, I'm not quite sure. I guess I was going the wrong direction. So our next strategy is um, something that you may consider. I, it just popped in my head one day, and I'm sure you've had a lot of experiences where you've done personality uh, assessments or um, all kinds of different things to help you know yourself. I have done tons of them. And I know sometimes you may feel that some of them, they don't quite relate to you fully, but then you talk to other people and they say, well, actually they do. And so it may be your blind spot. So one day I just put it all together because I realized that sometimes it takes people a little bit of time to get to know me. And because I'm not 
they can't really read me easily. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to create a user guide and I'm just going to put it all together to kind of summarize how I show up. And it's just been a hit. I've been sharing it around. I've I've used it at a job interview before. But most recently, when we got a, a new secretary in our office, I shared this with her. And I said, it takes people a little while to get to know me because when I'm really stressed out, I'm very quiet. So people may think that they've done something to me and they haven't. That's just how I am. And so I just talked to her and she said, you know what? You're a lot like my mom. And so this user guy just has, and it doesn't mean that I'm always this way because you can't be any one way. It depends on your audience, but this is this is who I am by default. And so you can see that it's a very, very strong personality um, and that can make some people feel uncomfortable. So I am learning to, to reflect on that and adjust myself. At one time, I thought this is just the way I am. Um, so when I say be true, it doesn't mean that you don't learn to be flexible over time and you but because you do have to adjust to people. So I know one of my areas that I constantly have to work on is being an active listener. I'm always a go-getter, always trying to diagnose somebody, trying to prescribe, trying to tell people what to do. So I have to slow down and listen and help leverage other people's story so that I am not being um, an accidental diminisher to them. So um at the end, I can share a link where you can make your own user guide um, based on this template I have in Canva. It's really great to do with teams of people, groups of kids, um, families. It's just an easy way to get to know each other and how to work on teams. So it's just, it's just been, um, people have really enjoyed using it. And so sometimes when I don't understand someone, I'll go, our whole team has a user guide. I'll go look at their user guide to see, okay, where can we connect? Okay, so strategy number four, you have to establish a vision for your work with people of what you want, because sometimes you may want something more for that person than they even want for themselves. Um, and, and that's okay, too. So in order, and you have to see where you want them to be, too. But more importantly, you also have to honor where they want to be. But when you're you're working with young children, they don't know. And so what I saw in Brittany, Brittany did not see in herself. And so um, it is important to always start with a vision of where you want them to be so that you can try to help them to identify where they want to be, too, so that you can help them with a, a actionable way to get to where they um, ultimately where they how they want to define their own successes. So um, many people ask me questions about how do you motivate these kids today? And I think it's, it's the same thing that motivates kids um, 20 years ago. And it is. Um, they have to have some clear goals. It has to be something that they care about, that they want. And you celebrate those small wins toward those goals. Um, and then they need to know that they are a vital part of the team, that they matter. Um, so I had to really um, overcome my need to, um, with the power struggles, because the way that I was raised uh, in rural Mississippi, you know, as kids were to be seen and not heard. And I was raised that way. So I had to overcome and unlearn a lot of that and see kids as they're actually great, great thought partners. And there's no hierarchy with power um, to because we all belong and we all should belong. And, and they have to know that they matter, too. So there are some things that they don't understand. And there are things that, yeah, as an adult, you have to make a call on. But um, from my experience, I've learned that we get more from them when they are a vital member of the team. So I used to start with doing a lot of planning and saying, hey, this is what you're going to do versus, hey, I have an idea. Um, this is what I'm thinking. Could you give me some feedback on that? And so that helps to motivate children when they are part of the plan. So the earlier you can get them involved in any of the plan um, and give you feedback on that, that I've seen that to motivate students. So when you have that vision for the student, it's important to go very, very specific and very granular with those students to make sure that they have the knowledge, the skills, and the dispositions. Brittany, um, she had the knowledge. She had some of the skills. She needed to work on some emotional um, regulation, but she had the skills. Um, but the dispositions, knowing what to do when and how to use her resources were just some of the things that we needed to work on. And that's what she's mastered now. And that's why she's successful. So getting real specific about what the student needs to work on and having a coordinated approach, because that's another thing that I've noticed is that sometimes it's so many people helping to support the child. We're often we're not on the same page and we're not aligned. And so maybe their goal that they have is not um, is not precise enough. 
is not um, is not chunked in a way that they could see progress toward those goals. And sometimes they lose motivation because of that. Okay, so thank you, Dr. White. Thank you. Um, so picking up in the presentation on effective communication skills, Dr. White just mentioned um, consistency a few minutes ago. And so when we're talking about effective communication, we also have to be careful and be mindful that our consistency in care is clear because we have so many children involved. My first teaching experience was at a psychiatric hospital. So being in the classroom, I was surrounded by a team every single day for every single student that was that was in my care in an elementary campus. Um, we talk, Brene Brown says, clear is kind. So we wanna make sure that effectively communicating within a system of care that's wrapped around our children, that we're providing the compassionate and we're providing the coordinated experience that our kids need to maximize, to be at their fullest potential when it comes to um, what these expectations and these outcomes are. Clear communication reduces stress and confusion. Even as adults working on a high school campus, it is so many different perspectives and so many different cultural differences that come into play when we're communicating that we have to mindful that we're not disrespectful, undermining or leaving any group of people out when we're doing our presentations or we're having these conversations. We want to make sure that we acknowledge and we um, we acknowledge and we respect every single person. My background is is a little different. Dr. White spoke about her experiences here in um, in Mississippi. I was born in the Caribbean. I was raised in Canada, and I know and now I live in America. And so, even raising my own children at home, I'm coming from three different cultural experiences and raising American children that I gave birth to. And so having to be mindful of that when I communicate some of the values that were instilled into me growing up on the island and then coming here. Another thing um, I talked about earlier um, with Dr. White was going to a private boarding school for girls and then coming here and teaching on a Title I campus and now managing three campuses where it's in a high poverty district, a district that has been an F rating for 10 years and being recruited into that environment was like, oh my goodness, how do I reach the parents? How do I reach the children who have lived in this state of mind for so long, but we expect to have the same outcome as if I were back in Canada in a different community. So making sure that I'm respecting the cultural differences, making sure that we're all respecting the cultural differences in a culturally sensitive manner is gonna make sure that we're in full alignment with what we expect for that child when we're providing care. Um, I talked about coordination of services. We all do different things. We're social workers, we're parents, we're educators, just a, just a vast array of different professionals that come together to take care of one child or to take care of a group of children. So make sure that um, we're clearly communicating, we're effectively communicating when we're coordinating our services um, to take care of children. Values. This this is one of um one of my favorite slides, I, you know, I mentioned this earlier. How do these values come to be? Just think for a second. How do your values come to be? Um, growing up with in a household where my grandmother was a preacher, she still is in her own right. She's 104. She'll be 104 in September. So I was raised um, to this day. If I call her right now, the first thing she's going to talk about, are you being respectful? How do you see people? How do people see you? Because how they see you is how I show up. So when we talk about um, our values emerge and they develop through a combination of factors from our upbringing, from our cultural influences, from personal experiences that we have gone through is how some of these values show up. They often begin to form during childhood and they continue to evolve over time. Um, and again, how we respond to different situations, our perceptions of situations, the decisions that we make, they all come from 
our experience, our lived experiences. So looking at shared values and um, our personal values, we need to see ourselves in each other. We really need to just take some time and see ourselves in each in each other. Our shared values, um, and just you, you know, feel free to take pictures of the slide as we go through. But our shared value provides us with a foundation for collective identity um, when it comes to societal norms. And um, personal values also reflect the diversity and the individuality within a society. So when we're looking at both of these values together or personal values and our shared values, um, these two are essential for fostering a sense of balance within ourselves, how we're taking care of each other, how we're taking care of the children that, we're, that are entrusted in our care. Does anyone have anything they would like to add on shared values or personal values or just your experiences when it comes to um, examples of values? I'm using my teacher wait time. Nicola, oh, I know that I, oh, I had to... Oh, I'm sorry. I knew, you I knew that was going to happen. No, you go right ahead. I'll go right <laughs> after you. I was just saying, like working with students, I realized that I was projecting a lot of my values onto them and their families. And that wasn't fair. Mm -hmm. I I agree. I've had that I've had that experience on my on a middle school campus because here I am walking in with my attitude and my value from coming from a private boarding school. And how dare you come to school showing your knee? I had to wear a uniform that was below my knee, <laughs> you know, and it goes back to children to be seen and not heard. But then I have my own child telling me, well, I have something to say and I'm, I'm going to continue. I'm going to stand my ground. I'm going to stand right here until you hear what I have to say, because what I have to say is important. And so I'm having to even reflect, wait a minute. Kids are supposed to be seen and not heard, but how am I raising resilient children if I'm not allowing you to use your voice to say what's coming, what's on the inside of you? Go ahead, Ms. Hawkins. Oh, so thank you. No, that was absolutely perfect because that just leads right into what I was going to say. And the beginning of it is just that watching, watching my parents there were educators as well and just watching them helped to establish my values, my respect, to see how they treated others and then in turn how they were treated. And so that that really led um, into, you know, how I, those were established for me. But then to piggyback on that, I took that into the classroom with me when I started teaching and that I did run into some some power struggles because I took my ideas in thinking that I ask you to do something, I shouldn't have to repeat myself because you're supposed to do it the first time I tell you. But, you know, I had to realize that I was dealing with a lot of uh, personalities and cultural differences. And, and then I'm adding my own in there. So, yes, very, very much so. This is very important that we take a step back and realize. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing that, Ms. Hawkins. I have, a, I have an eight-year-old granddaughter that sometimes I have to sit back and I'm thinking, it seems as if she's trying to raise me, you know, because some of the, <laughs> and Dr. White knows my story with this young lady, this little girl, but I love her dearly, but I'm raising her to be a strong woman or young lady who expresses her opinions, but teaching her how to do that in a respectful manner where you're still the child and I'm still the adult but you have permission to voice your, your your concerns. You have permission. And she told her teacher not too long ago, I'd like to have a conversation about how you treat me versus this other child. And just the way she, art and she was correct. Just the way she's articulating herself. Um, she called me last week and did a presentation on the ecosystem. And I sat back, just like you said earlier, Ms. Hawkins, they show up in how we raise them. And I watched this this little eight year old third grader do a presentation sounded just like we do right now. So it is important. It is important that 
we pay attention to our values. Dr. White said it earlier, how we're projecting, you also said it, Ms. Hawkins, which is confirmation, how we're projecting our values on each other, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's in the home, or whether it's just in the community, because we serve the community. So we have to be careful of how we show up and be authentic, be true. Doesn't mean we come out with filters on our cameras. We come out in our true authentic self so people can see us and begin to model and incorporate some of these behaviors and some of these values into how they show up later in life. Okay, so conflict resolution and problem solving. I, I absolutely love this section of the training because it, it tells me and I can feel myself going closer and closer into the restorative approach. And so I love this area. So leaning into conflict. You know, I've been married before. Most of us on this call probably have been or desire to be at some point in life. Most of us have children or desire to have children. And so one of the things that, you know, just even looking at this, Peace is not the absence of conflict. It is the ability to handle conflict by peaceful means. I know it myself with oil every day to walk in peace because I have to remind myself, regardless of what comes my way, how I handle it is going to be a direct reflection of not only my values, but how I want people to see me and how I want to lead. So we don't avoid conflict. We need to lean into conflict. Talking about growth happens in the struggle. People said the struggle is real. We need to embrace that. And we need to get to the heart of the realness so we can pull out what we need to get out of it. Um, you get to know people and also discover things about your own self when you're going through the struggle, when you're in this process. You want to embrace conflict to grow from it. What does that look like? Don't shy away from the disagreements. A lot of times, you know, you hear, I want to run away from that trouble. No, stand up, face it. You're going to find out some things about yourself you never thought. You never thought you had the strength to go into the work. But when you talk about going into the work for your children or going into the work for your team, going to the work for yourself, you're going to lean all the way in because that's how you're gonna come out with maximum benefit. Um, leaning into conflict also breeds innovation. It fosters understanding and it actually strength, strengthens relationship. My parents have been married for over 50 years and they're thicker than thieves. And I'm, you know, one day I sat back and I was like, mom, I want, I want my marriage to look just like yours. She said, be careful what you ask for because we had to go through some hard things. We had to face some hard things in life to get to where we are. So they leaned into each other. They relied on each other to get through the hard times. And so we need to make sure that when we run into conflicts with our children or with our job or with our colleagues, that we sit and we face it, we address it. Because in the benefit of children or even each other and the relationship, we're going to come out winners. We're going to win in this situation. Nicola, um, can I add something? Would you mind? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It's important for us not to try to move the mountain for kids. They need to they need to engage in struggle. They need to engage in conflict. Sometimes we don't want our kids, the kids that we serve, we do too much for them. So therefore, they don't know their strength because someone is always saving them. That's how they learn who they are. And that's how they learn to be experts of their own lives and form their own identities. We don't want them getting to college to have their first issue. Um, that the mom or, you know, grandma or foster mom can't call and take care of. We Again, we want them students to be advocates for themselves because there's tons and tons of research. Kids do have dreams. They do. Um, there's some positive things happening. They're graduating on time. More kids are graduating on time. But um, even being teen moms, that's been on a decline. But some of the things that we're struggling with, more and more kids are coming from abused homes and um, abusive homes. And our students are responding in that way. They're bringing that anger um, to school and in the community. And so when we say lean in, it's teaching them the proper way because any of us could look at these videos of things that's happening around our community 
And it's not proper, it's not the, the students um, may or may not have proper models to show them how to handle conflict. So leaning into conflict, but showing them how to do it, that you don't have to have a fight. You don't have to be physical. You don't have to use profanity because you have a disagreement. Mm -hmm. That is thank so you. true. Yes, no, thank you. Thank you for adding that. Um, and I see Ms. Holland put in the chat earlier, without the struggle, the butterfly would never fly. They will, they will never fly because there was no struggle. Um, I had to face a hard reality a few months ago with my younger son, very, very opinionated, very smart young man. But he told me, he said, mom, you protected and you sheltered me so much that I was scared when I went to college. I didn't know how to handle anything because you were always there. And I felt because of, you know, going through my divorce with two, raising two kid, two boy, young men now, um, I felt like I had to overcompensate. So I didn't want them to struggle. I didn't want them to feel pain, but I actually caused more damage because I'm paying for it now where they, the one of them will keep coming back to me. How do I handle this? I'm like, you're 20 some years old. What do you mean? How do you handle this? I never taught them because I did it for them. I did it for them. And so we also have to be careful, like Dr. Wise said, what are we saving our children from? Okay, so this, um, looking at my personality profile, I, I really, first of all, want to thank Dr. White. Um, we sat down at her kitchen table and we went through this whole prof profile together. I actually walked into my interview for this, for my principalship with this um, profile. I handed it to every single person and then I talked about it at the end when I had some time because it was important for them to understand who I was. How do I respond? Um, what stresses me out? Dishonesty, oh my gosh, it drives me absolutely crazy because it's not a value that, it wasn't anything that, you know, in my upbringing, my grandmother was a Baptist preacher. You better not even think dishonest. So for me, that's a huge pet peeve. People who are not following rules, we had a circle in our leadership team the other day and we actually had to share out, you know, what is one thing you'll walk away from your principal with? And I mean, we're sitting right there and they were being very honest. And one of the things that one of my deans said was honesty. Ms. Gardier doesn't, she will make sure, she will keep you honest. We're not cutting corners. We're going by the rules. I'm very flexible in my thinking. I'm very flexible in my behaviors, but I would not tolerate dishonesty. I don't like last minute changes. I mean, I know in this position, we all know in our positions, there's gonna be some last minute things. So we have to be flexible in our thinking. We have to be flexible in our moves. But if you know a month ago, please let me know a month ago. Don't bring it to me the night before. So, you know, making sure people understand some of the things that causes stress for me. Um, multiplying others, I love that. One of my, I did a book study a few years ago called The Multiplier Effect. And if you guys haven't read that book, I encourage you to find out where the strength lies within your team and use that to the benefit of the group, the benefit of the team, the benefit of the campus or even the home. Um, this, I actually, someone in the chat had put earlier that this was brilliant. Yes, this was a phenomenal experience. I'm on the leadership team at my church and we're actually doing this right now because we're having all these little conflicts, believe it or not, we're in churches, but we're having all these little conflicts in this ministry and this ministry. And it's because when you look at their personality, the spirit may have told them to come together, but it's not working with these two. So maybe we would need to go back to a hard place, go through some struggles together and redefine the vision and the goal of that organization to make sure that we're putting people together that can actually work together. So this is phenomenal. I pray you guys try this. My son and I, we talk about personality profiles all the time because he understands me better once he understands what the stresses are in my life. All right, so I'm looking at a wall of pictures and there's one thing about all my pictures, a commonality and it's family. Is that family unit. So to the top of the, um, to the, to the top corner, I was surrounded with the basketball team the um, the girls basketball, boys basketball team, and we were on a brand new football field. That was a phenomenal moment for us because both our girls and our boys advanced from, from one district 
advanced the area in, in all their sports during that season. So that was the whole team, the leadership team, the student body. And then at the bottom where you see um, two young men on the side, that's my ex-husband, 25 years divorced, but we, we're still raised, now we're raising grandchildren together. We have a phenomenal, phenomenal relationship. Talk about leaning into conflicts. Um, we never really argued, but the fact that we're divorced, there's a reason that happened. So me and my vulnerability, um, I found when I was going through my divorce, I, sh I covered a lot to protect my children because I didn't want them to see me sad. I didn't want them to see, I didn't want them to see pain in my eyes. So I literally walked around with a filter every single day, hiding my true self, hiding my true feelings because I didn't want to project that on them. But in the midst of it, I realized that how are they going to learn to deal with situations when it comes their way? If I'm not teaching them, if I'm not showing them. So I had to shed that and I had to start leaning into the hard places and let them see how to come through things. And so, you know, working through that situation with, um, with the family has been a phenomenal experience. We're one big happy family right now, 20 some years later. We still do family dinners. We still do everything together as a team because now we're raising resilient. We've raised resilient young men and now we're raising resilient grandchildren. Those are my grandchildren right there. And the top of the white is my parents and my siblings. And of course, our commissioner. I spent a lot of time working with Commissioner Marath on education policies. Um, I was training restorative discipline, um, restorative discipline practices um, through TEA. So I am a trainer of trainer for the state. But Commissioner Marath is also my frat brother. So I love him dearly. Okay, giving yourself permission to feel. It was a kind of a segue a few minutes ago when I talked about um, going through my divorce and have been divorced for 24 years. And that's me being very vulnerable right now because I'm actually a very private person, but I realized I wasn't teaching my children how, how to be resilient and work through hard places if they didn't know some of my struggles. Um, so in this journey of giving ourselves permission to feel, it is okay not to be okay. And sometimes we're not, a, we don't see that. It is okay to not be okay. Embrace your feeling as a messenger guiding you towards greater self-awareness and self-discovery. By giving yourself permission to feel, you actually empower yourself. You actually empower yourself um, and just moving through, moving through the pain that you feel sometimes with grace, but teaching those around you how to move the same way. Whether you're working in, in the capacity of a social worker, working with children from displaced environment, or if you're an educator, working with children, or you're on a team, making sure that you're empowering yourself and each other how to move through the pain with grace. And this is just some um, feelings that you can actually name and some triggers. A lot of time we don't, we don't pay attention to how we trigger each other, even in our own homes. If you are aware of something that's going to fire a child up or fire your colleagues up, just Think twice before you do that. Are you bringing value to yourself? Are you bringing value to the organization? Are you bringing value to that other person? So we're going to do an activity. Um, we're going to take a break in a little bit, guys. I know it's, um, it's a 90-minute session, but we know that you need just a little bit of time. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll build in a, a five-minute break. But whenever um, you are communicating, it's important to be mindful of your body language. 50 is 55% of what we say is our body language. So the students, um, the people on our teams, they're paying attention to, to all of that. So some common traps that happen in listening, and we're going th through these things because when we get ready to engage in a circle, it's very important to understand um, what you bring to the circle, the energy you bring. So that's why we, we talk a little bit about um, being mindful so that you can adjust and being careful to see how the receiver is actually taking the information that you're sharing as well. So um, oftentimes, if you look at these common traps, at any given moment, I know I've been guilty of them. That's why it's my flex goal to work on is because um, I'm always in a rush sometimes. And, and, and not that I don't value people, but it could appear that way if I'm interrupting their story. So um, 
there are different types of listing activities, but um, is during the circle, it's going to be very, very important to, to step outside of our story to really be one with the other person. So I'm going to play this quick video um, from Simon Sinek. It, it's a very meaningful video about being honest. We make this mistake all the time in our relationships, which is we think we have to be honest in the moment, but we don't read the room and understand that there's too much emotion involved to have a rational conversation. You know, somebody's mad at us and we're going, we, this is not the time for rational feedback. You meet emotion with emotion, you meet rational with rational. You can't mix the two. And sometimes we're rational, but they're emotional, which means we have to stand down, right? So what I've learned about honesty is we have to be honest, but we can actually delay. You have to meet rational with rational and emotional with emotional. That was very powerful. We, we make this mistake all Can I get someone to react to that? I will uh, react to that. The first thing that came to my mind was I, I don't make New Year's resolutions. But this year I told myself, I said, I'm going to match energy. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to match energy. So if someone's coming with positivity, I'm going to match that. If they're coming with negativity, I'm going to match that. I don't know that that's the best thing to think of. But but I was, uh, when he said that, I thought about that that is so true when you're dealing with a situation, whether, you know, especially with, if it's a conflict, if someone is heightened in their emotion, you kind of you need to you need to meet them where they are because otherwise you're not listening you're not hearing them you're not giving them a voice um, because they're telling you how they're feeling and if you're going and doing something totally different so you mm -hmm. so matching emotion with emotion doesn't mean you have to be just you know engaged in a big old brawl or anything but it just means that you're actually engaged where that person is and listening mm -hmm. to them that's that's mm -hmm. that's very powerful. Mm -hmm. Time it matters. Time it matters. So it's more about the connection than it is about being right. So we're going to part of empathetic listening is just doing that. It's really leaning in to see where that person is so that you can have the proper response. There are times when you need to ask open ended questions. You may need to affirm them. But there are times when you just just need to listen. So um, I'm going to stop the share for a second because Dr. I want to. I'm sorry yes. to interrupt, but there was somebody who had their hand raised and had oh, something to say. But okay. they've disappeared, so I want to invite them to um, to to unmute themselves and ask a question or comment. It was me. Um, this is Sherry, and one of the things that I wanted to share was when I was working with students, I love the concept of listening, but not really fixing or solving, just listening, but then circling back so that um, they know you know, they might be upset or whatever, but then, but they know you were listening. If you come back later and remind them that, you know, when we were talking yesterday, I heard you say, or I noticed that, and it's such a powerful tool for them to hear that you listened to them and remembered their words or their issue and that you are, you taking the time to circle back. So that's kind of what that reminded me of when y'all brought that up. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. We're going to do a, a practice really quickly. But first, I want you to think about something maybe from your team, your home. You could even go back just to any time in your life of something that you wish you would have told someone that you wish they knew. So I want you to think about that. Think about a situation where maybe you didn't have a voice at that time or you didn't know you had a voice or you didn't feel comfortable enough to to have a voice. What is something that you wish someone knew? It's important for everyone to participate. We're going to go into a, a breakout and we're going to practice being an attentive listener. So we want to honor that person's story. I'll jump in quick, real quick, Dr. White. Um, one of the things that I did with my own children was we always had, we always had a mat. I called it a placemat on a refrigerator, and it was where we left notes for each other. And I did this after I went through this um, restorative discipline training. And so we would leave notes for each other. I would come home and my son would leave a note on the refrigerator. I wish my mom knew I had a really rough day and there may be dishes in the sink, but I need 
time. Just give me 20 minutes because I will come in the door fired up about a, a dirty sink. And so just being respectful of that, um, I wish my, and I would come home sometime. I wish my son knew I dealt with discipline all day. Give me 30 minutes before you come to me with some other situations. And so just being respectful and just, again, being open-minded and letting people know what's in your heart. Okay, so I want to put us in a quick breakout so that you can talk and share of what you wish someone knew. Okay, Nicola, take us away with the restorative circle. All righty, welcome back, welcome back. The breaks are never long enough, but they're so well needed. So going into restorative circles, um, we're going to have a circle experience today from a virtual standpoint. I've done this in Nigeria, but I had a facilitator on the ground. So I'm looking forward to this part of the training. So restorative circle, um, restorative practices began in Texas in the fall of 2015. This was through um, the Texas Education Agency, actually at the University of Texas at Austin School of Social Work. We talk about this practice being greatly influenced by indigenous people. Um, they actually most often sat in a circle and they would pass a talking piece and encourage people to engage in deep listening. One of the things that Dr. White talked about earlier is that when you're in a circle, only one person is doing the talking. So the other people are actually listening. We didn't really do a good job in our little breakout room because we were so excited to be in a private space <laughs> that we were talking and talking and talking. So we're going to go through this um, deep listening activity here in a minute. So the five R's of restorative practices actually centers on relationship, respect, um, responsibility, repair, responsibility, um, and reintegration. I shared with, um, this picture is just, um, I did circles with some of the elementary students in Marlin. And so they just really, really loved that time. But they struggled with not talking, especially in larger circles, because you're hearing so much and you really want to say something. But this is really critical that you just respect the talking piece and you just listen. I had to learn this valuable lesson. Um, and I talked about it in my book. Um, circle up, which is an, on Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, um, all over the place. But I talked about my son actually teaching me this very valuable lesson. I, you know, single parent, home after work, dad was in Afghanistan, and I'm busy trying to cook, do homework, lay clothes out for the next day. And he was trying to tell me a story or telling me something about school. And I'm like, I don't have time right now. So I kept over talking and over talking and giving him instructions of what I wanted done but never given him the time. And he said to me, he's like, mom, let's play past the mic. And I'm like, past the mic? What is this? And he says, the only time you could actually talk is if you have the microphone. So he really slowed me down long enough. And he would actually hold the mic a little bit longer to teach me how to wait. <laughs> and so we're we'll get to experience that today. So some of the significance of um, restorative circles is facilitating commitment and connection. Building trust and, um, and resilience is also key when we're talking about the circles. And also how do we, I'm sorry, empower um, the relationship and take ownership. How do we take ownership for what's taking place that brought us to the circle in the first place? And addressing the root cause of issues. When we are forced to listen, we actually get a chance to hear what someone else is saying. Um, let's see. So we, we, we always make sure that we establish norms when we're going into a circle, in a circle process. Can you go back to the norms um, slide for me, Dr. White? Okay, there you go. Can you go back to the norms? Establishing norms in the circle. There you go. So you want to make sure that you're talking on, you're speaking on topics as briefly as possible. Speak from the heart. Always, always, always speak from the heart. You want to make sure that you're listening with respect. No judgment. This is not the place for you to judge because you have to understand that people are exposing their vulnerability at this point and they need to feel safe. You want to maintain confidentiality. One of the things I always say, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. And we need to be true to that. I always 
when you're in a circle and you'll get a chance to do some of these things, even in your, you know, with your jobs or at homes or whatever the case may be, I always have everyone repeat that. What happens in the circle stays in the circle. And while I'm doing that, I'm actually looking around to see who's saying it. And I don't stop until everybody in the circle owns that commitment. Because you have to remember, sometimes the things that happen in the circle will create will create some open wounds for other people. And they need to make sure they're safe enough to say that and not hear it on the streets. Um, maintain confidentiality. Now, I've always cautioned my students or even I've always cautioned my students when it comes to confidentiality. If it is anything that is going to cause you or create an unsafe situation, then I may have to share that information with your counselor. I may have to report it to a different organization. It just depends on what it is. So the students know, and I always tell the kids, share what you're comfortable sharing. And if there's something else you would like to add that you don't want to share in that group, then we meet about it later. I've had students come out in these groups where they're actually having different ideations, where we actually had to go straight to the counselor office, but they knew not to put everything in that group, but to share with me later on. So always make sure you want to celebrate every round. I always snap it up. And what that means is after everyone has an opportunity to share, you need to have some type of way to celebrate that round, to close it out before you move into another one. Always assume good intent. When, I'll go back to celebration for a second. So with my younger kids in elementary, when I do this, I have those little clapper things I get from Amazon and they love it. They'll be just shaking, 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 shaking. Whereas with my cheerleaders, when they were having conflicts in a group, they had their pom-poms. And that's how we celebrated the closing of each round with that group. So um, it is really interesting. Thank you, Dr. White. So what does a circle process look like? So there's certain things that you always bring to a circle. You always wanna have a talking piece and it just depends. When I'm working with, it depends on what the talking piece, it can be a baton. When I'm working with my athletes, especially during track season, I use my baton as my talking piece. Um, what I do with my um, band, I use an instrument. It just depends on what you want to use to hold significance as your talking piece. Centerpiece always represents that family. So when I do it at home, I always have each one of my kids will bring something from their rooms or that's significant to them. And we place that in the center of the circle. You want to make sure you remove all barriers. So don't have a circle around a dining room table. And if you plan to sit on your chairs, then just move the table away. So you have no barriers to your communication. Your centerpiece sits in the center of that circle, whatever that may be. And I go back to athletics. They always come with their basketball. They come with a the volleyball. They come with whatever the case may be that represents that group. And that's what your centerpiece is. I always start out with a values round and I'm going through the process right now. I always start out with a value round and I'll do something like name a value and state who taught it to you, who taught it to you. And to me, that value round is always to kind of get an ear of who's in the circle. And also just to give them a full circle experience. So for example, I may say, a value I hold dear is respect. It was taught to me by, by my grandmother. And I moved to the other person, then the other person. So everyone gets a chance and we snap it up or we celebrate the end of that um, round. And then every circle has prompts. So it could be one prompt. It could be three prompts. It could be four prompts. It just depends on what's going on, why you're at the actual circle at that particular time. And you always have a closing round. So you start with the opening and you always end with a closing. Um, before we go into the breakout room, we're gonna practice with two prompts today. And I believe they're in that, um, they're in the document that you shared, Dr. White. Yes, they are. And you can also take a picture right here of these prompts too. We probably will not get to two prompts. so. Um, but you can take a picture of it. Okay. And so before we go into the circle, do we have any questions at all? 
any questions on. I'm gonna give you instructions before we go into the circle, just so you guys have a um, so you guys are comfortable. <clears throat> so what I'm gonna do right now, I will start out the actual circle by reading the opening. Once you get into the circle, if you would name one person as your facilitator, that will kind of okay, Dr. White. If you're in a circle, then you'll kind of prompt person one to be the person that's speaking. When that person is done, you can prompt the second person because we don't actually have something to pass around. So I will need one volunteer in each group to kind of lead who goes next. Please be mindful of when you're in that circle, only one person is doing the talking. And after you're done, after the last person shares out, then you snap it out. When we return to the main group, I will close it out. So if we're ready, give me a thumbs up and I'll read the opening. Do we see thumbs up everywhere? Nicola, how much time would you like to have in this round? I would say five minutes. That will give everyone. I don't think we had enough. Yeah, I would say. Well, actually, no, we could do three minutes because we don't have that many people in each group. Thank you, Miss Saxton. Well, uh, just question. So is that three minutes per person or five minutes no, per person? No, ma'am, total. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So if we're ready, I am going to um, go ahead and read the opening. And we will go through the first prompt and then come back to the, then come back to the main group, Dr. White. So here's our opening. In the circle of our hearts, resilience thrives. Through trials and triumphs, our spirits survive. Gathered here in this space, we weave stories untold. In the warmth of compassion, we unfold. With each breath, we embrace the unknown. Resilience, our guide in path, path we have sown. At this time, we will go into our breakout rooms and we will each respond to the first prompts. We will close out the circle, snap it up and return to the main group. Dr. White, are you back? I am back. Awesome. So I'm looking at the time and we're doing very well. I was a little nervous at one point. But I just want to get a couple of people to share out, not necessarily share out what was shared, that what you talked about in the group, because we want to make sure that we maintain confidentiality. That's something that we need to be very careful of. What happens in the group stays in the group. So just share your experience. Was it difficult just to listen? I know the groups were smaller, so it was a little bit easier for me to listen and not wait for 10 people to share, but just two or three people to share your experiences before we go into closing and final questions. Any group leaders? I, I think our group, we, our group was uh, really nice to share in. I think we all kind of linked it with similar circumstance or uh, experiences. So it was really fun to hear each other's stories and to link together with something in common. We found we had some other things in common. And one of the girls I work with, and I didn't even know that story, Tisa. So <laughs> anyway, that was that was good. Thank you. That's good. And, and in those spaces, sometimes we learn things about each or, each other that causes us to have a greater, you know, we value them differently when you come out of a circle. So that's good to hear that, you know, someone that you actually work with, you learn something new today. Anyone else? Nicole, I want to mention that I appreciate it got uncomfortable because of the lack of, I guess, um, comfort. And so it got quiet. And so I said that it's important to embrace the silence too. And at, yeah. at the beginning, and then over time, the conversation will continue. So it's okay to embrace the silence. And you want to speak when you're comfortable with speaking. So not everybody has to share um, because some parts may be painful for some certain people. So um, it could be organic. Mm -hmm. and, and it's always important. You know, I've been in circles where, you know, the person has to touch the talking piece and just pass it to acknowledge they're part of the circle because you don't want anyone to feel left out. Um, another thing too, circles could be, 
you can have different circles. You can have a celebration circle. Your mom is coming home from the hospital. Let's celebrate that. You're, you have a child coming back from an alternative placement and you want to reintegrate it back into your classroom. They've been gone for four to five days. How do you welcome that student back into your classroom? Your child was incarcerated and now he's coming back home. How do you welcome that child back into the family so they don't feel like a failure? So a lot of times we talk about restorative circles and we talk about repairing harm, but a lot of times we don't talk about the celebrations that could actually take place in a circle. It's not always about going to these hard places. It's sometimes celebrating the hard places you came from. And what are you what are you celebrating now? So anyone else before I go into the closing? There is a question in the chat about how often do you hold these groups? It just certain? depends. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for asking that question. Um, it just depends on the situation. Um, I had circles every Friday for students on my campus that were involved in a fight when I was an assistant principal. I didn't call it a fight circle. I call it the conflict resolution circle. So whenever you see there's a need to bring the group together or bring the family together is when I suggest you don't want to overdo it because you don't want to miss or you don't want to kind of confuse the power in the circle. But we had kids who were fighting all the time. And so for me, let's have a conversation. Let's check in. I had another one where the neighbor complained. They called the school and complained about our children littering after school, throwing trash on their, you know, over in their yard. And so I had the counselor pull every student that lived on that route. And I started having community circles, how to respect the community, how to value the community. What is, what is a good citizen look like? So it just depends on the situation at the time that you would want to call a circle together. Did that answer your question? That question was from Misty Watt. Yes, Misty, it did. did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Let and we go. have only about two more minutes. Yes, and I'm going to go ahead and do the closing right now. So this is closing the circle. In the embrace of the circle, we find solace. Resilience, our beacon in life, diverse chorus. As we depart, may our spirits rise with the strength of resilience, we harmonize in the tapestry of our shared humanity. Resilience binds us with unwavering unity. And that is the end of our time today. Um, um, Ms. Holland, I know we're at one minute. Um, Dr. White, any closing statements? If you guys wouldn't mind, if you could... Um quick survey for us to help us get better. We want to always create a culture of feedback and it's good to do with students as well to ask them, what do we need to change to better support them? And so if you could do that for us and then we just ask that you stay social with us. Nicola, we love to be out in the community helping with different events. And so feel free to contact us and ask any questions. We would love to be thought partners. So um, at this time, um, if you can, you can snap a picture of that, we want to, we want to respect your time. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Holland. Thank you, Dr. Fikag. We appreciate you. We look forward to doing some more work with you. Um, we live in the community. This is our heart. Thank you, everybody, Thank for attending today's training. Can we give a round of applause on our cameras for our speakers? Thank you very much to both of you ladies. This was outstanding. I will be sending a link to everybody who completed the training for the evaluation. Please let us know what you thought of today's experience and give us ideas for future training opportunities. And also I'll be sending your CEU certificates. Thank you everybody. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.